We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. I'll start briefly with what made what was my experience in multi-stakeholder dialogues. So a few weeks ago, I joined a global discussion on AI, and I was perhaps one of the few people from the global south in that room, and I felt quite excluded because uh, all the people who were participating in that discussion were, one, much older than I was, so there was this age dimension, and uh, two, so they, which which doesn't mean anything, but w to me it was these were entrenched networks which had been communicating with each other for long. So I was like, okay, how do I talk to them? I don't know. They are not interested. So on, uh, and it was a space which was not very inclusive. So I felt that even as someone representing an international organization which comes with a lot of social capital, you still can feel excluded in a setting. So that wasn't great. To the other side, it was a great experience joining uh, a session which the Youth and Voice Office organized with the Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed because they were very exclu inclusive. They had in our introductions asked us what are our pronouns. Uh, they made sure that the conversation flows and we can go and talk and there was no difference uh, in engaging with the uh, with the UN Assistant Secretary General in terms of what we could say, what we could not say. So it was a very inclusive setting. Uh, but that's my experience. I will uh, probably go on with Hillary to share your experience of what, how did you feel in a multi-stakeholder setting? You have maybe one minute. Yeah. Thanks, Prithi, again. Hi, everyone. So great to join you. Very excited to learn from everyone's experiences as well. I think for me, Prithi, same as you, I also feel like oftentimes the space of this discussion could be more inclusive uh, as a young woman, especially young woman from Global South, young woman of color. Obviously, it's uh, for me, it's uh, kind of um, still rare to see representation of people that look like me in these spaces. So I really wish that could be improved in the upcoming years. I think one of the interesting things that I found is that, because I work with young people and I'm a young person myself, the discussion on AI, um, uh, whether if it's taking place on a more informal spatial sis, like again, uh, just using the medium that the young people often use, like TikTok, Clubhouse, Twitter, is often more um, inviting in a sense because they lose, they use less of a jargon heavy term. So I feel like even if you're not an expert in AI, you would be more compelled to like, or more inclined to join this conversation and actually pay attention to the development of the, both the policies and the innovations that are taking place in this space. So I feel like these are kind of like the unique perspective that I saw that, uh, conversations and dialogues outside formal institutions is actually very dynamic and inclusive in a way that is not intimidating, especially for young people and uh, 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 representation of communities from vulnerable groups. So that would be my take. But curious as well to hear from the other uh, panelists who are joining us today. That's, that's a great point. How do we get away from our institutional setups and join the communities where they feel comfortable instead of bringing them here. And sometimes it leads to a lot of tokenization as well. Uh, thank you, Hilary, for sharing that. Uh, perhaps Esther, would you like to take the floor next in uh, how did you feel as a participant in a multi-stakeholder conversation? Uh, what was your experience of inclusion or exclusion in such a setting? Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Pratik. I think for, for me, one of the greatest, um, uh, I hope you can hear me very well. Um, one of the, the, the most important um, uh, aspect in terms of a multi-stakeholder approaches is really how the information is captured or how it's translated from different stakeholders. So um, one of the things, especially with this new emerging technology and more specifically around AI, um, there's different views and different point of views that um, the different institution would have. What government regards as AI or the opportunities that AI would, would bring to the ecosystem, 
um, what regulators would look, how regulators would look at um, at AI and um, and more importantly, what startups um, really are trying to invest in, in 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 this ecosystem. I think for me, um, the idea is around how do we make sure that that conversation is is flowing. Um, really well and this is something that um that in particular we've tried to to curate and, and and see if it can happen um but also having a global so there's having a global view of of different subjects uh whether you include um and i'm not saying let's say for a small country like Rwanda or for for us to see the the stakeholders are going to only be people from Rwanda the institutions from Rwanda but then in such conversation how do we um uh, enlarge the 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 ecosystem so i think that has been um for me my experience especially for these new technologies trying to go out of um uh, the stakeholders in Rwanda only and expanding our horizon and seeing if that would work that's a great insight uh, from your experience at the national level and how to enlarge that conversation, even around definitions and how we talk about the topic and how different people understand. Um, so Joanna, uh, you, you've been engaging on this topic uh, since uh, a long time, I would believe. Uh, what, what, what has been your experience um, as, as, in an, as an academic uh, of being exclude, feeling excluded or included in different settings. Uh, let's take the example of a policy setting. So as an academic, when you come to a policy setting or vice versa, when you welcome uh, other people into an academic setting, which can be quite intimidating sometimes for people. Uh, how, how has your experience been? Hi. I think, uh, thank you very much for having me. And yeah, I, I feel like I need to represent old white people, which is kind of a weird thing for me to be representing. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, um, but I can't, and I can't. I mean, that's a, sort of part of the point. Everyone is individual. Uh, and so when I think about inclusion and exclusion, you know, I was excluded as a little kid. And then I didn't, exp I, then I was a, p uh, a computer programmer when not a lot of women, although more than now, were computer programmers in the, in the 1980s. And so, and then I was a computer scientist. I was quite frequently the only woman in a department. And so I, I still, am a, I, I remember one time in particular when I started moving more into working in the social sciences and I walked into a room and I heard this weird noise I hadn't heard like since, I don't know, high school. And then I realized it was women laughing. Like there were more women than men in the room and someone had just made a joke. And I literally didn't even recognize the noise. So uh, leapfrogging forward to now, I think, um, I think there's something, and this may be having lived through Trump and Brexit, I keep moving, I'm now in Berlin, uh, that, that uh, I feel so much safer and so much more included when I'm in an inclusive environment. So I love uh, being in diverse environments. And again, maybe it's because I'm a woman. I don't know if the same experience is true for everybody in my, you know, from my demographic. Um, but I, I actually uh, feel safer then. But what makes me feel really excluded, and I realize that this may sound awful, but I just want to be honest, is uh, if I don't feel like I'm getting respect or that my degree isn't getting respect or if I see other people being disrespected. I think, I think weirdly to me, one of the biggest parts of uh, inclusion is, is uh, acknowledgement, not of me as an individual, but acknowledgement that, that, there, that, that there are different kinds of experience and expertise and that we see uh, what, how that's useful. So I, 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 I can't uh, in one minute also cover all the range of experiences I've had, but I, I think, I, I hope that I sort of did. I mean, one, one thing I just found out last night, and, and this goes to another weird part of my identity, was that people were astounded that I don't care how many people are in an audience, that it is not more intimidating to have more than fewer people there. And uh, so maybe part of my experience is because I'm neuroatypical or something like that, that I never self-identified was, wasn't a thing in the 20th century for me. And now I'm starting to realize, oh yeah, a lot of computer scientists, we just do think a little differently. And maybe I just never noticed that the number of people in the audience mattered. Um, so yeah, there, there's all different kinds of ways to be different. <laughs> yeah. And so maybe and I haven't noticed all the kinds that, of inclusion I, I've experienced. <laughs> I think that's great because this is really, and I, I really thank you for being honest about your experience because what we want to do is also, when we are talking about multi-stakeholder, have a safe space to share our experiences. So thank you for that. And it's it's really helpful to learn for some of us that even people who are experienced have so many degrees under their belt 
can also feel excluded because it gives you hope that I am not alone. I'm not alone in this space. Uh, it's and what can we do then together to make it more inclusive? Uh, thanks for sharing that. Uh, Jibu, I'll, I'll come to you next and then I'll quickly go to Tim. Uh, so you're curating a platform. And uh, so this gives you a lot of power to actually bring in some voices or not. Uh, how do you in your daily work experience or uh, experience inclusion or exclusion? And how do you actually also translate uh, inclusivity on the platform? Okay, uh, that's a very interesting question, Pratik. Uh, and uh, I hope my, uh, I hope you can hear me. I have very well. a bit uh, used with uh, internet. Is, is it fine? Yes, it is very well. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I'm very happy to be here in this home with uh, such a uh, interesting and, uh, you know, esteemed panelist. Uh, and so, uh, when it comes to what we do in, in terms of India AI, creating a platform, uh, you know, our whole mandate is to bring together this multiple stakeholders. In, in fact, uh, that's our uh, whole objective, you know. So, as a country, India is never short of talents uh, and resources, but the biggest challenge we have found is these things are sitting in silos, whether it's data search, whether it's research work. So how can you bring all these people, right, from the academia to the industry partners, to the government organizations, civic bodies, uh, and uh, startup community and together and create a unified ecosystem. So that was our uh, role number one. And uh, one thing, uh, as uh, you know, as you mentioned uh, about in inclusion and exclusion, I, I felt is, uh, in, uh, in general uh, policy discussions or anything that happens related to AI, there's a tendency for it to get dominated by a more tech focused approach, especially when you're talking about uh, issues with regarding to ethics, uh, responsible AI, which are mo mostly uh, social, moral and ethical problems, right? I mean, there is this tendency where uh, you try to solve this moral and ethical problems that is created by this technology, by adding more technology on top of that by the same people who. Presentation um. from uh, academicians, from social science background, uh, or uh, something like uh, the, the other kind of voices, right? For example, when you're talking about ethics and AI, there is a general uh, domination from a Western standpoint of view when, when the fact is uh, there is a huge difference between Eastern. Uh, you know, collective point of thinking and Western individual point of thinking as well. So I feel uh, this is something I feel an uh, exclusion that been happening happened. So when we had this opportunity to create this and curate this platform, we ensured that we represent all the voice, right? Whether it's uh, academic or and from multiple perspective, how can you uh, look at a uh, look at a situation from the eyes of various stakeholders? You know, how do you bring everyone together? So I think I learned these lessons being part of many discussions where I have uh, I had the uh, you know the most part of experiencing this uh, you know uh, not, not included in many of these things so so that I can fix what is wrong there in our own approach thank you thank you thank you so much Shibu for sharing that and and I do agree that um, I mean at one of the conferences where I was participating recently uh, we had a professor from Japan a professor from India and uh, they, 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 they were not really involved. Uh, it seemed that others were speaking the same language and uh, they were sitting and having lunch alone. I was like, this is terrible. This, this means that the space is not inclusive. Why are we not listening to experts? Because one, uh, they come, pro I, I don't know, for whatever reasons, I think this is not nice. Uh, and, and this also kind of makes me reflect whether as an outcome of the discussion that we are having, if there will be a gumption for having a global south network of uh, participants uh, who can who who are willing to collaborate and discuss on a regular basis, and we at UNESCO can actually incubate this kind of work and host this, not to control or but to just facilitate. Uh, I think that could be also something that we'd love to discuss at some point. Uh, so before before we move on, I, I'd also like to ask Tim, uh, who's who's a partner um, representing Innovation for Policy Foundation, on uh, because they are involved in a lot of inclusive dialogues, and which he'll also share soon the processes. 
what wh what has been your experience tim uh, of exclusion or inclusion in these kind of settings on policies thank you Patika. thank you for for hearing all of the the, the the interesting use case from everyone well or maybe let me share a personal experience first and then maybe try to connect it to the to the research i'm presenting later so i was actually calling my mom yesterday and she asked me that first question so hey what are you actually what are you actually working on so i told her so i'm uh, tomorrow i'm actually uh, participating in a panel on artificial intelligence and she's like, hmm, that sounds complicated. And she, she went on asking about how is the weather, you know, where I am at the moment. And I was like, hey, but she's, if she hears artificial intelligence, she immediately like uh, quits the discussion. And while I was thinking, this is a form of self-exclusion. So actually I think, and then I, I, I started the discussion. I was like, so, hey, do you know actually that maybe the tax authority in the Netherlands is, is deciding whether you will be audited or not. And it's based on an algorithm. That's actually something that's really happening in the Netherlands at the moment. And do you know that your YouTube, uh, they, they, the recommendations you get, it's, it's, it's a computer that's deciding for you what maybe you want to see next. So I was thinking like my mom, a middle, middle class from the, uh, woman from the Netherlands, if she's already self-excluding herself from the discussion, what does it mean for even, you know, you were talking about the global South. So, so my learning would be, how can we, can we like make the discussion um, bite-sized so people can actually feel like they want to deliberate and, and participate in the discussion? And I think that's also what we will see that, that that's something that policymakers should do. This is actually, if somebody says, does some self-exclusion, that you actually reach out and say, okay, but this is important for you. And this is why it's important for you. And this is how you can contribute to the discussion. So. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. I, I, I can attest to that. It's It's been my experience with my mom as well. Uh, I'm talking on different panels and, and she's like, what are you doing? Uh, what, what is this stuff? And and sometimes it's it's difficult to involve uh, them in the conversation. They're like, oh, my son is at the UN and he's doing something, but I can't describe it too much to my friends. He's, he will come into it himself. So uh, definitely. And I think what you mentioned about bite-sized conversation and to make the policy process more inclusive, because at the end of the day, why we have so much detachment from the policy process globally and the trust in policymaking is because people just don't understand. And they say that, oh, these are experts. They do their stuff. And in the end, we suffer. Uh, so there is this breakdown in legitimacy. And this, I think, can also change if we involve people and are more inclusive, which brings me to uh, you, Tim, back uh, to share the process that you and the i for policy team has developed. And then we go with our panelists again in a conversation. Uh, over to you, Tim. Okay, let me just share my screen to have a, I don't want to interrupt this uh, beautiful discussion uh, too, too much. So let me just take uh, two minutes to, to discuss our preliminary work that will be forthcoming uh, in a joint publication with UNESCO next uh, February and 2022. Um, so actually we, we, we took a deliberative approach ourselves uh, in, in, in this work uh, as well. Uh, we had three workshops where, where we discussed human rights and the impact of AI. And also we had a workshop with policymakers to discuss real life examples uh, of people that were involved in policy processes and the participatory elements that, that were actually in there, uh, apart from the desk research we did. But we, we, we've we seen uh, more than 18, almost 20 countries that, that, that had an AI strategy or an AI policy document and that, that, devised, that, that designed a, a process and all of them had some participatory elements in them. And that's where we drew lessons from them. And that's also what we will present in our forthcoming um, report. Uh, and besides this, I think this IGF workshop is, is, is part of our process in coming up with our recommendations and lessons learned. Because uh, the, the topics we discussed in the workshops and the case studies we saw, uh, they, those are the same questions we will dis discuss today. So I'm, I'm really curious to hear from all the experts, but also from the audience, uh, what their concerns are, what their um, um, important uh, takeaways are, but also if there are some interesting case studies that maybe we haven't seen yet, uh, be it in AI policy or some other policies. Um, so please do participate. I'm uh, really welcoming uh, everyone to, to, to put in their 10 cents. Um, so first of all, we, we discussed why is this time different? Because uh, some people still uh, believe uh, artificial intelligence is a hype because they say uh, we've been talking about AI since the 60s. Uh, why is it different? It's like the, you know, the electronic skateboards or the, the flying skateboards from Back to the Future. This will never happen. 
Uh, but we actually, we firmly believe that this time is different. Uh, and with us many experts, and I believe everyone in this room has the same uh, opinion, because it's, it's pervasive and it impacts all of our lives, uh, whether you like it or not. And that's one of the key things. It's, it's almost impossible to opt out. Uh, AI will decide many things of you, even if you're not aware of it. While at the same time, this, at this stage of the, of, the, um, of the technology, there's a lack of transparency and accountability. There are no scrut scrutiny mechanisms yet to really fully understand what, what's being done and how it's being regulated. And this is most worrying because the impact of AI is, is asymmetric. It enlarges uh, uh, already uh, existing um, inequalities, be it in, in race, gender, or social status, or any other inequality. Um, and because of this vast impact and this, this uh, risk that, it, that, it, that is inherent in AI, we believe everyone should be involved because it impacts everyone. And we need everyone to solve the ethical dilemmas that, has, um, that are involved uh, with AI technology and the development of AI. Um, so maybe the lessons we learned, uh, I, I, I just took two quotes uh, from, uh, from Jake, a Nigerian lawyer uh, and uh, an um, activist. And he's actually saying inclusion is not only about participation, but also about engagement, representation, and empowerment of disabled and unrepresented groups. I'm not saying my mom is disabled, but uh, at least the empowering is like asking the right questions and saying like, hey, your opinion matters and make it bite-sized. And I think this was a really nice quote. Uh, and even if the farmer in India, uh, a cattle herder in Argentina, uh, if, they, if, if there's AI impact on them, they should also be represented, they should be on the table, but it's not about inviting them on the table, but it's also empowering them to, to actually have a say at the table. So I really like this quote, that's why I, I highlighted it here. Uh, then I have another quote from, uh, from a, a Chilean uh, policymaker, and the Chile process is actually very nice, uh, uh, very nice example of a multi-stakeholder approach. We will also highlight it in our, in our report. Uh, what they found out is actually that the multi-stakeholder approach itself can be an education process. So it actually started with a blank agenda, uh, and they let people come up themselves with, what do you want to discuss? What is interesting to you? What is, what is important to you? Uh, and they had several phases that they, they were transparent about the process they were going to do. And they found out that there were constant feedback loops between the participants and the policymaker and the politicians and the experts involved. So even the, the process itself was a learning experience. And already this sets a, a solid foundation of the monitoring and involvement of, of a long-term engagement uh, from people uh, in the process and see what's being done. And also seeing and asking questions about uh, to companies, but also to governments like, hey, what are you doing in AI? So I really like this, this quote and, and um, the Chile process is a really nice example of a multi-stakeholder process. Uh, so based on all the, 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 on the, the conversations we've had, the workshops, we, we kind of uh, summarized 10 building blocks or lessons, so to say, uh, on how to make inclusive policies. Um, I listed a few, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure we will discuss most, uh, most of them also here in, the, in this room. Um, and at the same time, maybe we find some new, so maybe in the, in the final report, we make 11 building blocks or nine or eight because, because of the discussion we, we will have today. Um, but I think learning is key. Uh, it should be understandable. There should be also data policies because usually AI is as good as the data you feed. Feed it. So if there's inequality in the data or biases in the data, that will also show up uh, in your um, in, in the outcome of your AI application. So so not not even AI policies is important, but also the data policies that lie underneath the um, the AI policies. And it's not only about putting people at the table, giving them a chance to say something at the table, but also influence them uh, while while there's decision making, and also uh, talk about it and, and be accountable for decisions that that are being made. Uh, so these are just a few I wanted to highlight, but I'm very curious, of course, to hear from you and keep the conversation flowing uh, and to see um, how we're going to uh, um, yeah, input, uh, give, give, uh, provide all your inputs and, and see how we can summarize it also in our report. Uh, so as I said, the report will be forthcoming. We are we'll, we'll, in the validation phase of the report. Uh, so please do participate and share your experience and please reach out to us if you want to uh, want to participate and want to be updated about uh, our progress of the report. So I think back to you, Pratik. I'm very interested to hear about everyone that's in this room today. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Tim, for sharing the process so far. And it's, of course, uh, 
uh, we, we, we are here to challenge the process and uh, the insights. And, and perhaps I will, I, will, I will quickly ask Joanna, uh, jo Joanna, do you think it is really different this time? Uh, and when, we, when, when uh, we just saw Tim presenting uh, from electricity to motors to AI, uh, is it different? What do you think is different or if it is not? floor is yours. Uh, well, uh, great question. Uh, uh, so uh, this is a, this is just a short response, I, right? Um, yes. Yeah, okay. So the, uh, the so there's two sides, yes and no. <laughs> so uh, let me say no first. A lot of things that people think are being caused by, uh, by artificial intelligence or social media or whatever, we know we've seen historically in the past. There's always been disinformation. There's not always, but frequently been uh, political polarization. Um, and we can look and we can see uh, explanations. So I really think it's very important to look back now that I've been looking at the impacts of AI and governance for a while, I realized that even like, you know, when the horse first came to Europe, there's commonalities between that. A horse isn't exactly technology, but it's used by humans like technology. So, so in some ways, uh, whenever you reduce the cost of distance, you introduce new governing challenges and AI is like that. On the other hand, when you increase our capacity to communicate, then you do change. And this is again true across biology. If you can communicate more, then you, it's easier to more quickly find uh, ways to create public goods. And, and in one way to think about that is that you're finding ways to create new organizations. And a lot of the things that we've seen first get in on the digital technology, maybe some of them we're, we're not pleased about and we're afraid of who we're helping uh, to coordinate. But I think on the other hand, we are seeing uh, you know, the, an un, uh, unprecedented uh, uh, opportunity for inclusion. And a lot of the things that people found frightening are actually uh, consequences of the fact that we are empowering you know, huge amounts of humanity to do things that they never were able to do. Everyone can go further, they can know more than they've ever been able to before. And of course that changes again, it changes governance. So I would say yes and no, there's, there's huge changes and, but we can learn from history. Thanks, thanks so much for that, Joanna. Uh, Esther, since we, since we kind of uh, are discussing our on this point on governance, uh, in your view, and I know that you've also run uh, processes for AI policy development in Rwanda, how, how has been your experience in multi-stakeholder approaches to AI policy development? And how have you, what are some of the governance challenges that you have encountered uh, so far? I think you, Pratik. And, and, and I think for us, where we are today is, um, we're almost at the end of the journey of developing an AI press. So we've taken um, different approaches. One, we've worked with um, development partners to actually develop the, the policy itself. But other than that, um, and in that process, how we've looked at it is, um, is, is really think about if we are working with development partners, how do we bring into this conversation uh, people like the academic, especially academia, because um, one of the things that we look at for, for something like AI is how many jobs are you going to be creating? What types of jobs are you going to be creating? And also thinking about that skilling value chain that you'll be able to, um, to really think about. Um, on another level, what we always think about, what we've also thought about is bringing on board, um, let's say the role of regulators has been thinking about data protection, um, environment like, um, like where we are seeing a lot of algorithms and these AI spaces, especially for a country like Rwanda, um, where most of our data sets that AI algorithms are, um, are trained on, um, most of the time do not have data sets that are coming from, uh, from our countries. So one, how do we approach creating those data sets? And secondly, how do we approach 
really looking and integrating uh, those algorithms um, in, 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 in really having a responsible AI um, aspect to this. Um, and then on the other side, something else that we've also looked at is trying to think about and really engage um, startups um, in saying, so how would you, uh, what would be the journey for private sector to actually get here, um, to actually integrate AI, but also various new AI companies that are coming um, on board. And lastly, in terms of governance, um, I think it's very important for us that the government takes um, almost the lead. Um, and what we, the journey we're taking is, is identifying which use cases um, can we better apply AI on. So it's, it's this type of conversation that we are having um, at different levels. Um, for example, um, our regulator will be the ones that will put out the ethical guidelines that, that the industry that will guide the industry. Um, and um, for us, when we put in place the policy, but also trying to, 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 to find a way for all other as this, um, all other stakeholders to actually play in this. And moving um, at a later stage, what we are actually working with GIZ on is uh, with the Fair Forward program is around um, now creating specific projects that can be Pan-African, um, that could be, that also uh, really bring in context um, here, this is like in areas like developing um, Kenya around the best um, algorithms, use cases, etc. And I think in terms of governance, that is really um, putting at the forefront that government is interested or is 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 encouraging um, such innovative ideas around uh, around AI evolution. And and of course, when we think about um, and I'll come back around the data set part of it. That's where we heavily think about inclusion um, because at the end of the day, if um, any, the type of data your algorithm is going to be best on, is going to be trained on, will determine how inclusive um, your AI economy is going to, to be. So, so this is an approach that we try to, to, bring, to bring up um, in how we've developed um, our policy, but also in the approach we've taken in, in terms of engagement in learning through the process and bringing on board experts um, and learning through that process of saying, how do we go about this? And this is a journey and or not an end per se. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Esther. I think that's a great point to hear from a government official uh, saying that we go open up to stakeholders and say, this is a process, this is a journey, what are your views? We are also learning and we are also co-creating this. So I think that's a great point. And also something that you mentioned super important about data and uh, creating those commons and scaling up some of the projects that you're working on in Rwanda. And then uh, it, it's, it links also with what Joanna said is an opportunity to create uh, common resources, which can then be leveraged uh, uh, globally or in the region. Perhaps uh, Joanna is laughing and I didn't, she didn't make that point perhaps. Oh, you did, okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, I, I also know that there are people in the audience who can participate in uh, Poland and I know colleague Eleonor is there. And uh, Eleonor, can you hear us? Uh, uh, you are on mute. Uh, can the IGF secretariat please? Um, and there are a number of points in the chat in the meantime, and I will definitely come to both. The point by uh, Veronica, which I'll at a can point. Can you hear me? Yes, Eleanor, uh, we can very well hear you. Uh, thanks, and sorry, we, we uh, this is a bit of a I hybrid feel arrangement. very excluded. <laughs> I've been sitting here. I've been sitting here all this while listening to everybody give their contributions, and I think that um, perhaps the technology failed um, to let you see me. But and, um, I, and I'm so sorry because I was asking my team, 
where is Eleanor? Where is she? We can't see her. Uh, we just saw the room. So we are glad to see you finally. Uh, Eleanor, the floor is yours. Uh, we would love to learn about multi-stakeholder approaches because I know you've been working quite extensively globally on what has worked and what has not worked. And can you give us your truth on hard truth of what works and what doesn't work? And also your criticisms of how international organizations engage and whether that is inclusive or not. I would for sure like to learn on what we can do differently at UNESCO to make multi-stakeholder processes work in reality and not just in publications. Over to you, Eleanor. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, um, so I, I must say that Pratik, um, I'm privileged to be working with the Alliance for Affordable Internet um, as the broadest coalition of technology and the leading advocate for affordable internet globally. So even though we are not working directly on AI, we work on connectivity, which is the foundation um, that you need um, uh, to, to be able to get to AI and all the innovations that come with it. And we have been working with a very uh, strong multi-stakeholder approach. We believe that uh, you need to be very inclusive, not just in the engagement process, but you should also include people in the decision making, in the execution of uh, policies and how you co-create as well. And we, you know, within the Alliance for Affordable Internet, so the way we work is we have local coalitions in various countries. And these uh, local coalitions, we bring together government, public sector, academia, private sector, and civil society in a very open, and uh, discussion format where we look at the, the policy gaps within a country, we look at the problems that we want to solve, and then we look at the various solutions and the data that is needed to, to be able to make a very persuasive argument. Now, one of the, the very uh, big successes for us is how open we are, especially with governments, uh, with policymakers, and also with private sector uh, players as well. When we bring everyone together, uh, we make sure that we have a very um, open discussion. We are able to bring, uh, have people sit around, have questions that are leading, that will give us a chance to explore uh, what the gaps are and what the solutions are. And uh, one of the things that we notice is that a lot of civil society groups uh, do not tend to have the resources to be in these sessions. So when we want when we want to have a very strong multi stakeholder engagement, we bring them, we we give them some kind of support, especially when we work in, in uh, a lot of developing countries. We ensure that um, their transportation and um, other resources are covered so that they can be able to participate fully in in these um, engagements. And then one of the things that we also tend to look at is um, in terms of the research that we do. We want to make sure that it's very inclusive. We look at a very intersectional approach when it comes to uh, issues like gender. Uh, we want to make sure that if you're looking at uh, women's groups, um, they are represented not just um, urban women or educated women. Uh, we look at whether um, they are in, um, you know, women who do not have the uh, educational level, make sure that they are also represented at the various uh, local coalitions that we work in. And so we work very, very closely with a lot of CSOs to be able to give us that kind of representation. But one of the things that I've also noticed um, in a lot of these multi-stakeholder um, engagements, especially when we work at the global level, is that we fail to see how to bring people from uh, regional levels, and es especially those in developing areas and global south, and making sure that they are part of the conversation. So we, you know, it's it's very dangerous to um, fall into tokenism, where you just get one person coming in, and that person is supposed to represent an entire continent or speak for an entire group of people. Um, it's important that we get people who come in. We get uh, a diverse group of people who come in, and when they come in, we give everybody the chance to actually participate and be included in the conversation which means that in conversations about AI, we need to look beyond English because a lot of times the conversations are in English. And this, what it means is that people who do not speak English 
um, or do not speak the level of English or understand the technicalities and the technical jargons, then feel excluded. So it's one thing that UNESCO might want to look at how we can have a lot of these discussions in languages that are understandable. But on also, it's important to look at policy makers. And I, I saw that one or two of the uh, participants spoke about the role of governments. Governments are very, very important in these conversations. If we are going to design policies and legislations that are going to cover ethics and AI, we need to make sure that we can break down these um, technical descriptions, um, make sure that they understand, um, ensure that they are comfortable and feel safe enough to be able to say that they feel uncomfortable about a lot of these discussions. And so this is something that UNESCO might want to look at, how to be able to bring a lot of policymakers up to speed on a lot of the technical issues regarding AI, and also make sure that we create a safe uh, space for them to be able to come back to us and ask for iterations in a lot of the discussions that we have. So, you know, the experience from A4AI is very, very important in these uh, spaces. We should look beyond just uh, international discussions. We should look at uh, regional and also at local um, multi-stakeholder engagements, making sure that we are not just in the capital cities, for instance, uh, we're having discussions about AI. The people who are going to be impacted by the decisions that we make should be in the room. And they might not be able to speak the language uh, that we have, but they could be, we can break it down for them in a very simple format so that they can, they can tell us whether they agree or how, how this will also impact them eventually. So um, issues about localization of the discussion and also making sure that we're able to increase participation at various levels. Uh, finally, we should also look at connectivity. I mean, we can't talk about AI without connectivity. And uh, what I've noticed in one of the sessions uh, that we uh, have participated previously where um, we were having a discussion about access was that the people who uh, we wanted to make the, the, the most insightful inputs could not connect because it was either the connectivity was not good or it was not affordable. So I, I think that in another way, UNESCO should also look at how to um, support some of the connectivity efforts that we've started. Um, if OIA has been talking about meaningful connectivity, I think it's important to join forces uh, with ITU and, and others uh, in us to be able to uh, push a lot more governments to improve connectivity, but also how to make it affordable so that when it comes to discussions on AI and how to evolve from there, uh, we, we, we don't leave people behind. So Pratik, a lot of things for UNESCO to consider. Thank, thank, thank you, Eleanor. Just don't hand over the mic because I have a follow-up. Uh, so, so thank you so much for touching upon so many points. And I think we will definitely try to discuss and engage with you on the coalitions that you work on at locally, because for us, it is important. One of the things that one of our field office colleagues from Yaun, they mentioned uh, to me a few days ago was that uh, they, they work with community radios and how can some of the information on community radios around these topics can be transmitted. Now, the question internally was, if there is no connectivity, uh, it's on community radios, what is the benefit? But I'm still not convinced. I think information needs to flow and information needs to reach. And I think it would be interesting to uh, engage with you and the Alliance and the communities that you work with to kind of co-create something. And I'm for sure uh, the Youth in Voice office is always very supportive of getting in more youth engagement in these topics as well. But uh, the question that I had for you was uh, with something that uh, Tim also alluded to in his presentation when he cited Jake, uh, was multi-stakeholder processes should not just be at the stage of creation, but also at a later point. How does that work? I, I don't know. I want to understand how, how do you, what is this governance mechanism where you make multi-stakeholderism part of governance. Can you give some examples of that? So I, I think if I'm trying to understand your question, uh, what you're saying is that when we uh, design or whatever discussions that we have about multi-stakeholderism, uh, policies that we come up with, um, you're talking about the kind of metrics, how do we measure success and how do we ensure that we are able to uh, ensure accountability? 
and it, it will come from the way we, um, you know, the kind of co-creation we have. For instance, if you're in a country, um, I'll give an example that we worked in Liberia um, on the national broadband, uh, national ICT policy, and uh, we had to develop um, various metrics, targets that, um, you know, we expect the country to be able to achieve. For instance, some of the gender targets. And so it, it was important that in this discussion, we brought all stakeholders together, women's groups, uh, we brought the regulator together, we brought um, the private sector players together because they have to offer the services. And uh, once you're done and we've decided these are the targets we want to uh, attain within year one, year two, year three, uh, we then come to, you know, we have to find who's going to be who follow up on accountability. And that's where the civil society groups and academia will be very important. Because um, in terms of research that needs to be carried out, we need to see how we can support those groups to be able to track progress that is being made and then also be able to show whether that progress is indeed in line with what uh, we had, you know, co collectively what we had wanted to achieve. And so um, I think there's some kind of resource that's also financial resource that is required. There's also the skill set that is, is required. And then also there is the um, resource in terms of um, you know, monitoring and evaluation that is required. So it starts from us all agreeing this is the, this is the targets that we want to attain. This is what we want to see and then also being able to support the groups that will be able to carry this out. And, and I think in the multi-stakeholder sets and civil society is very well placed, um, and that includes academia and all the other groups to be able to do this. So I don't know if I answered your question. Thank Pratik. you. No, uh, absolutely. I think, so, so my question was how to make multi-stakeholder a process and not just a starting point. And uh, from what you said, I understand that it's the accountability and the engagement and the research that uh, civil society, academia, uh, and the other actors bring in, which actually makes the process of governance uh, multi-stakeholder through this route of accountability. Just to give you a small example, when I hear Greta, uh, Greta Thunberg go on stage at a UN conference and says that all UN speeches, people are doing blah, 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 it pushes me to be more accountable when I'm writing a speech for my boss and say, oh, we can't just use the same things. We need to act and we need to do certain things and then talk about it. Uh, we need to walk the talk. So I think that is how I understood accountability uh, and the impact of youth engagement. And this is perhaps in a way also how multi-stakeholderism impacts policy discussions and governance. Uh, if I, if I, did I understand well, so you... I, I think that's then what I'll add to this is that the role of civil society here is very important. So it's very, I can understand that, yes, we, we like to have sound bites sometimes. We policymakers like to sound good in the media and, um, you know, they want to make sure that they have the, you know, the right, uh, the, the points that would resonate well with the audience. And that also goes along with what they have in their policy. But somebody has to be able to check whether that is, you know, what is what, whether there's a disconnect between what has been said and what has been done. And that's where the criticisms will tend to come in. So at the end of the day, uh, we expect people like the in the media, we expect research groups, we expect uh, civil society, we expect think tanks to be able to hold uh, the various processes to account. And they do this by research. And so that's where I feel that groups, I mean, like UNESCO and, and um, others will be able to look at um, how to empower a lot more civil society groups who are independent uh, to be able to um, hold um, a lot of these processes to account as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Eleanor. That's really helpful. Uh, I, I see that there are a number of points in the chat and uh, I, I, I would come to Hillary and then to Jibu. Uh, but for, first of all, Hillary, uh, Veronica, you had a question around youth engagement. Would you like to take the floor yourself or, or I should read out what you mentioned? Uh, so Veronica is in the chat. I'll wait for a little while. Uh, she's if right here. Ah, okay. So, yeah, please pass on the mic to Veronica then. Okay, she's, all right, she's, she's picking up a mic. Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you for uh, taking that message. So, yeah, I'm here. Uh, the point was 
particularly on how we engage youth groups as part of the bigger civil society as so far. And I'm particularly talking about the work we've done with the Council of Europe, the Youth Department, where we actually analyzed last year the whole different processes, uh, UN, OECD, the Council of Europe, and the UN youth groups were not actually participating in that part. So mm -hmm. accepting that, participating in these processes is an educational approach. How do we ensure that? And we, of course, we also have some proposals of how to do it, but that, uh, I think it's part of a different thing. But I'm talking about youth groups as organized groups, yeah? So not random scattered young people that you just happen to meet and ask. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, the angle. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. Thank you so much, Veronica, for that question. Um, I, I, will, I will direct this question to Hillary. Uh, Hillary, the floor is yours. Thanks, Pratik. And thank you, Veronica. I think clearly this is also something that we often see a lot in the youth spaces as well. So I completely agree with you. There's not enough youth inclusion in this space. And just again, taking like a, an example of like the ones that Patrick just mentioned on the climate space, we could see how young people are frustrated for not being included in these processes. And then I think uh, this is exactly why um, youth engagement, particularly meaningful youth engagement, needs to be mainstream in institutions like the UN, like the private sector, and all of these multi-stakeholder partners. So for instance, like in the UN, um, I work in the UN Secretary General's Envoy on Youth Office, which represents the Secretary General on a lot of the youth programmings and coordinating the different interagency work uh, that uh, is doing for and with young people. One of the things that we're really trying to push is that for every single program you make, uh, it is important for you to embed the youth strategy principle on meaningful youth engagement, which includes that youth engagement must be institutionally mandated. It must be right-based. It must be uh, transparent and accountable. So we actually have um, a tool, you might say, to in that hopes to ensure that this um, meaningful youth engagement principles is mainstream all across the UN process, whether it's UNESCO's work, whether it's our work at the Secretariat, whether it's our work at the ITU, and it's so far, uh, the process has been very uh, encouraging to see how it's being mainstream. I think the question is that, yeah, uh, that you were also saying that uh, we need to engage youth as an organized group, and I think this is also where I would have to point out that um, young people are not homogeneous, like they're very diverse. So we need to take into account that um, there are organized uh, youth groups, for instance, official youth constituency that the UN works a lot, that the partners works a lot with, but also grassroots youth is as important as you see in the climate movement with their Fridays for Futures, who's been able to mobilize on a grassroots level and perhaps also include uh, young people who are not usual suspect. I think the key to make sure like how this, um, how we can include young people more in a more meaningful way is actually listening to them uh, by active listening. Um, for example, last year during the G7 summit in the, their specific youth summit, actually the youth delegates have already uh, suggested um, or a call to action that for every single um, uh, uh, AI policy processes, like there should be uh, a youth council to, to, be, to be established uh, that could help youth delegate represent each members of countries in the G7 as an acting uh, youth voice for AI policymakers. So actually young people are not just uh, sharing their frustration of the exclusion, but they're also trying to provide solutions to this. However, we would need, I think, strong commitment right from policymakers from institutions like the UN as well to make sure that these recommendations are actively listened and taken into account. I think for instance for every single uh, plans uh, of governments and policymakers to create technology council or oversight board which we know now is happening a lot in kind of uh, helping uh, to shape AI uh, policy processes and the, the future of AI development. We need to make sure that young people particularly not just you know not just young people for the sake of that they're young, but also young people of color, young people with disabilities, indigenous youth are represented in this uh, councils and oversight board in the first place. So there shouldn't be, so I guess nothing with us without, uh, nothing about us without us, right? So I think it's important to make sure that ex, uh, accessibility to opportunities like this uh, or to participate in a more decision-making uh, role is accessible for young people. And it goes back to, I guess, Eleanor's um, point in terms of creating enabling environment that allows young people to contribute, whether it's providing translation, providing 
uh, financial support that will allow them to take part in these digital consultations or offline consultations even for those who don't even have connectivity access. I think it I guess there's no straight answer into how do we meaningfully engage youth in this, but I would say the key word is one um, intentional commitment for youth inclusion from institutions and policymakers by actually listening to the solutions that young people have proposed because there's plenty of this already. And the second is establishing an enabling environment that makes these processes as transparent and inclusive as possible. And I would strongly, I guess, also encourage, right? to food groups or for partners that champions young people or like uh, partners who wish to support young people's participation to also uh, reach out and then uh, uh, and explore collaboration opportunities with institutions like the UN. Like for instance, our office at the Youth Secretary General's Envoy on Youth Office works with partners like UNESCO, like Pratik has shared, or ITU, UNICEF, and everyone else in kind of seeing how could how we could create entry points for young people, particularly youth groups, whether they're organized or whether they're grassroots, so they could be represented as themselves. So instead of us speaking on behalf of them, it's actually us bringing them in the space to be in this, uh, to be in a place where they could speak on behalf of new generation. Um, one of the other, I guess one of the latest examples that we did was we actually hosted a, a, a very uh, honest dialogue with the UN leadership, with the Deputy Secretary General of the UN, uh, Amina Mohammed, with young people, particularly youth activists. Um, most of them are young women and also young innovators in this space on how do they feel in terms of uh, uh, young people's participation in um, shaping policy processes, whether it's for AI for other or other technologies, and all of them have said the same thing that they would actually need partners, whether it's from institutions or others, to help create pathways. And I think it's particularly important to also bring up the fact that we need intergenerational partnership in this because young people wouldn't be able to um, uh, break through these barriers without having allies and partners uh, from other generations who are uh, currently holding roles and powers to make decisions. So I think um, if I could just conclude my answer is that uh, look at it in a way that these are the generation that is will inherit the future and has and will also inherit the impact of our current decisions today. So your children, your nephew, your nieces, your sisters, and everyone else uh, who are young people who are, whose life is affected on a daily basis uh, from AI technology, whether it's predictive algorithm or whether it's in the future um, facial recognitions they should be able to take part in shaping the discourse of this uh, of this thing. So uh, I hope I shared, uh, I answered the question, but over back to you, Pratik. Thank, thank you. Course. Thank you, Hilary. It, it would be also very interesting if you could in the chat share some of the tools and resources that you mentioned on how to have this meaningful engagement. And I'm sure because we have a lot of partners around the table, uh, whether it's Esther in the government, Joanna in the academia, or partners from the civil society who may find this useful uh, tool as well uh, coming from uh, coming from your office in some of their uh, projects and planning. Uh, I, I know that Ork from the audience also wanted to take this flow. Uh, if you would like uh, the flow would be, yes, I see. Yes, the floor is yours, Ork. I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name correct. Please correct me. No, thank wrong. you very much. My name is uh, Auke. Uh, Auke from the Netherlands, uh, working as consultant AI trusted analytics at KPMG. Um, and I heard um, many, many things that I agree with. Um, I'll explain a little bit what we do and um, how we tried and uh, come up with a multi-stakeholder approach in our uh, uh, trusted analytics ad advisors. So uh, if uh, a company hires us, we take a look at, um, we try to come up with a multi-stakeholder panel and approach on um, all the different variables that are relevant. And we try to scrape all the variables that are not relevant because a lot of data is being uh, collected from uh, different organizations, but not everything is relevant in creating a certain AI system. 
Um, after that, after that's implemented, we also have a team that does IT audits. So that um, takes a look at the algorithm or at the AI system that has been created. And we um, take a look at in what's created and if that's still relevant and up to date to the current uh, state um, in society. Because you can develop a system at one point in time, but if culture changes or uh, the whole um, the different approach to certain topics, uh, also your algorithm or AI system needs to be updated. And we try to keep that, uh, that loop and we try to keep uh, those systems up to date and we'll try to help our clients uh, in having responsible data science. And um, what we now see is that it's upcoming, that those companies are aware that it matters. Um, but we certainly try to uh, to make this as inclusive as, pos as inclusive as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Oke, for sharing this because I think uh, as we talk about multi-stakeholderism and we talk about responsible AI, it is really important uh, to understand the role that the private sector plays and pushing some of these tools and some of these developments. And uh, this first brings me to Jibu, and then I'll come back to Joanna on the question around polarization. Uh, Jibu, first to you. Uh, so, so we've you were working with a lot of private sector organizations. Uh, how do you see uptake about involve responsible AI and uh, the need for multi-stakeholder participation in the private sector uh, in the Indian context? If if you would like to share, and also another point, if you can respond to two, uh, we've also heard a lot about languages. Uh, we, we heard Eleanor mention about language and inclusion. Uh, what Are there some of the concrete examples from your platform to bring in uh, linguistic diversity and people who speak or write or use different languages uh, to also engage? So you have two questions, floor is yours. Yes, uh, I think, uh, you know, fantastic. Uh, some of the ideas that we shared here by Hillary and Eleanor, they were very, very fantastic and very enlightening. Uh, coming to your point, I think what we see from a private sector standpoint of view, we, we see companies are struggling to come uh, come to terms with the gulf between what they understand to be their legal right to use AI and uh, their social right, right, which they don't possess by default. So that's, uh, I feel, uh, the, the, the first part, right? We, we, we see that from time to time again. And so... So in order to accomplish this sort of social right, what we feel is the stakeholders' trust uh, in these AI applications is critical. And uh, this, this can be done through dialogues and discourse only. Now, coming to the whole uh, conversation around responsible AI, to be honest, I think we have reached a point where it, has, it is a lot of noise. Uh, everyone is repeating the same thing over and over again, and it has become uh, it, com it, it has been commoditized. That's the saddest thing. Well, like I said, you're trying to solve a technological problem by creating a technological solution through responsible AI uh, technologies, right? When fundamentally many of these issues are social and uh, you know, moral and ethical in nature. Now, coming to India, I think the, the engagement, when you speak about multi-stakeholder engagement, that mostly comes through uh, the government, uh, as we have seen, right, from time to time. I think, in fact, in 2018, when, when the country started its current AI journey, right, the preliminary meeting was organized by the government where, you know, uh, stakeholders from the IT industry, government organizations, civic bodies, uh, members of academia, everyone was there. And the outcome was uh, quite fascinating that in the end, they, they all uh, had this unanimous thought that, uh, you know, the, the primary... Uh, the first design principle for uh, AI in India has to be uh, AI for uh, all, right? So, which means, uh, in, you know, inclusion in, in, in many terms. So, but again, coming to the private sector, I think the organizations like uh, NASCOM, which I belong to, has been playing a, a crucial role in bringing many of the stakeholders together. But apart from that, uh, what is happening in, in India, India is mostly... The government is what is driving this uh, initiative, and the, the the fascinating thing is uh, this has been trickling down into a 
a provisional uh, thing you know when you look from a policy standpoint of it right so so and and today we have hundreds of ai tools deployed uh, from the public sector as private sector which are in the nature of ai for social good or ai for empowerment you know more, mostly uh, with people and from time to time we see large consultations happening whether it's about uh, preparing the ai strategy paper or uh, responsible ai approach paper and frameworks uh, and uh, things like that and uh, and the, coming back to the trickling down part the interesting part what we see is some of the states in india doing a fantastic job when it comes to creating frameworks uh, you know with a uh, multi stakeholder participation uh, and one good example will be tamil nadu the states uh, safe and ethical ai policy that was released last year right and so this this has a framework that was introduced that can evaluate you know ai systems and give a scorecard based on its uh, you know the ethical and the safety uh, points and this is enforced by the uh, you know it department and has created procurement guidelines on what you know on what all you can do with the uh, ai system that are publicly deployed so this is the kind of thing i feel uh, we need going forward uh, frameworks uh, you know with with of course with the participation of uh, everyone who is involved uh, you know inclusive uh, community driven frameworks that are enforceable rather than what we are saying right now is a lot of chatter saying you know we need responsible ai and then there you have a 10 or 20 companies in the private sector each of each of them has their own responsible ai principles right and uh, uh, which again makes the whole process much more uh, complex so i i hope i answered the thank you. first question thank you thank so, you so much thank you so much on that one and let me interject uh, you on that because i want to bring in joanna first because something that you mentioned is uh, interesting so so what we heard from you is what is the toolkit of uh, making these processes what is the plumbing that makes responsible ai work you produce guidelines you produce for procurement standards and then work with industry bodies who then try to implement this this is great one thing that you also mentioned was about responsible ai being a buzzword and i know i i think joanna feels a bit has some opinions about trustworthy ai and uh, right. and this whole kind of deterministic view ai for social good ai for that ai for this joanna would you like to come in on this point and don your ethical ethics professor hat and and shed some some, some light on this okay great um i i'm now slightly uh not sure which way to go with this or with the uh the other question I asked earlier about polarization that will um, come later so oh, that's later time. okay yeah. great okay um yeah no I, it's a, that's just a it's a basic uh you could you could probably have said it myself yourself that that i just worry about uh first of all there's two parts of what you just said one is the trustworthy ai responsible ai those kinds of uh lines are talking about the artificial intelligence as if it is an anthropomorphic other and the most important thing if we're trying to uh hold our societies together is that we correctly attribute responsibility to the person who has developed the artifact and by when i say the person i don't and i shouldn't have just said developed um it's often a corporation uh that that may have de that developed and designed and initially sold and then there's a question of the owner operator and uh, who who are the people who would be responsible so for example with a car there's the company that built the car there's the person who owns the car and the person who's currently driving the car and there could possibly have been someone who broke into the garage and interfered with the car right so all those same problems and people that we've been dealing with uh, judicially forever we also deal with artificial intelligence about and so i just have a real concern about you know two pieces one of which is the that 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 we don't anthropomorphize the ai and that we're very clear about who we really want to trust and the ai is if anything just a vector for transparency so we either do or do not uh put the effort into making our systems easy to understand and making accountability easy to trace and only governance and enforcement can can uh assure that people do that good practice um but the other side that you that uh that Pratik just sort of prompted me on is the uh AI for good. Um it's of course a great idea to do good, but and 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 everything we do now we practically we use AI for if we if we're uh you know lucky enough to have access to digital technology. But um when people talk about AI for good, I always worry about it because it's not like, you know, because we've uh 
you know, we, we, we've, you know, made some, you know, planted some trees or something with, you know, through the, through crowdsourcing through AI, that that means it's okay that we also gathered at the same time, a giant database of people that we then use to surveil and disempower. So uh, there, there no amount of good AI counteracts the bad things that can be done. And so I don't, while I do want to do good, I don't think we need to mention AI that much unless it helps us bring more resources. And I guess that's what people are doing. Um, but I don't want it to be used to, to sort of uh, muddy the waters around the incredible importance of making sure that we are using artificial intelligence appropriately and, and that, you know, that, that, we, that we are uh, defending ourselves from harms. Thank, thank you so much, Joanna, for that. I think that's this, this also the first part of what you touch about not to anthropomorphize AI should feed into the procurement guidelines and the standards which the private sector uh, is developing and, and it should not be a we trust AI, but we need to trust the process and the people who are designing these technologies. So, so I hope uh, this resonates also with some of the remarks uh, which Shibu made and before from OK. Uh, at this point, I would also, I, I think we have about 10, 12 minutes left. I would also like to bring in uh, uh, Esther. And uh, on this point, Esther, you mentioned something about startups and uh, youth involvement and uh, how, how, uh, how, how to basically, uh, so I, I'm losing my thought here, but you mentioned something about polarization and jobs, right? And the, a lot of the focus in countries in national AI strategies is around creation of jobs and skills. So what, what are some of the challenges and thinking that you have experienced in this uh, in this field around how do we create jobs? What are the political pressures and pools? How are how are you implementing this? What are some of the challenges in terms of uh, if if I were to put it this way, public pressure uh, as a government official? And then I'll get in Joanna to respond uh, on polarization and how we can solve that. So I, I don't know if my question is clear, but it's around jobs and AI and how do you create it and how do you implement it through your policies? Over to you, uh, Esther. So I think the screen is frozen, but that's uh, okay. We can wait a few seconds for that. Uh, automation. Perfect, you're back online, Esther. Okay. Every, every every time someone talks about AI and um, it, it translates to automation and that specifically talks about um, very big losses of, of jobs um, in terms of um, yeah, so so loss of jobs for different um, different areas and uh, I think one of the biggest uh, when you're designing the policy, it's also being very intentional. I, I hope there's not, it's not too much annoying. Perhaps, perhaps for, for some time, we can all switch off our video so that maybe it's better. Esther, we're, we're not able to hear you very well. Uh, we, we, we've switched off our video. If you would also like to speak with the video off, maybe that helps the connection a bit and we can hear you and then we can, uh, yeah. Um. So I see that Esther is not on the chat, uh, not on the call anymore. Uh, but uh, Esther, do you hear us? Um, yes, perfect. So the floor is your Esther, we are listening. Okay, perfect. Let me try and, and, and do this quickly. So um, essentially one of the key areas when every time we talk about um, AI that translates to automation and specifically we go to uh, job losses. 
so I think um, in in terms of uh, um, in terms of policy making or different interventions to really put out is being very intentional in identifying and putting out the messaging around what other opportunities are there for young people. So I think one of the key we've identified is in around data annotation um, and, and, and similar activities that really would create um, even more jobs than what we are seeing today. So I think that intentionality when it comes to when it comes to, to, to policy making, especially around jobs, and what that means um, in an AI economy is very, very important um, at, at this level. I think that's one of the biggest message that we've, we, we're we thinking through and, and understanding how to actually um, uh, to bring it across. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Esther. So, so we understand that one of the tools while, while we are talking about policies and polarization, so it's a big issue, automation and people feeling scared of job losses. And one of the things that you as a government uh, do is to direct them uh, in a very uh, methodological, uh, well thought out way that there is no need to panic we are providing you the tools and we are standing behind you to support that, whether it's through incubating a startup ecosystem or through creating new opportunities, as you mentioned with data. Um, so, uh, so everyone, we can have our videos on back uh, now. So, so Joanna, the question to you is, we talk about polarization. I know you've been researching polarization and income inequality and so on. Uh, what, what, what is it that multi-stakeholder processes can bring to reduce this polarization? What can, how can they, uh, you know, calm down the debate a bit? That, that's a really interesting question. Let, let me tie this back into what Esther was just saying, which is really super important. Um, when we're thinking about automation, a lot of people are worried that they're going to lose their jobs. Um, but again, the data show that, that people don't lose their jobs when we have more AI, uh, but rather the, do, the jobs do change. And, um, and in particular, uh, so for example, for bank tellers, when they became automated teller machines or, when, or for radiologists, you know, five years ago, one of the gods of machine learning, uh, Jeff Hinton said, radiologists uh, should, should all retrain. We don't need any more. Maybe they should just get something else to do because machine learning can do better. And in five years, we won't have radiologists. Now there's more radiologists than there's ever been. Now there's more bank tellers. Um, why is that? Actually using the technology made them more productive. So there, it's now in more people's interest to hire those. So banks have more branches and uh, that, may, that may be temporary, we'll see. But, uh, but it's been true for decades now. And uh, there's more radiologists, more little tiny uh, clinics can afford a radiologist because that, those radiologists are able to do so much more with the new technology. At the same time, what it does do is uh, technology kind of makes us all a little more exchangeable. So going back to what I said in the first time about you know, the fear that you feel when you aren't respected for the amount of time that you spent developing skills. A lot of people, they used to talk about the Luddites who, who broke up the machines. It turns out that they weren't protesting against their being machines. They're protesting against the machines not being paid the same amount as they were being paid per part they were making. So they recognized it was the threat on their wages that was the real problem. And this comes back to polarization in case you were wondering. So this was, uh, in fact, political polarization is not correlated with increased internet access or increased uh, um, uh, social media use, but it is correlated with increasing inequality, and but not in every country. And it turns out that uh, what we've done in our most recent research is published uh, this time last year, uh, we found uh, a good explanation for why that would be. It's actually that as you become more economically precarious, you could just can't take as many risks. And so you're afraid to work with the outgroup you, because you can predict the in-group more easily. And so you start fractionating society. And we've actually, this is not published yet, but the last summer we were looking uh, to test this, uh, looking across uh, a larger range of countries and looking at uh, the data. And indeed, it seems that uh, not only does inequality increase when you are at greater risk of uh, losing your job or losing your house. So when your local economy is declining, 
um, but also our uh, trust drops. The much larger effect is so trust is a luxury. And, and you only trust when, when you can afford to, to be wrong, basically. And so that's, that's why we need economic support. And getting back to that uh, contrast that some societies like China and actually Germany have, have increasing inequality without increasing uh, polarization, at least so far, um, it, it's because uh, they were working very hard to make sure that everybody was being kept along with the increasing uh, economy. So um, in, in terms of inclusion, I guess the most important point to make is that uh, initially when new technologies come in, like everything gets scrambled. We, we seem to really like to have at least a little competition. There's a way, there's something called the Gini coefficient about judging if people are equal or unequal. And uh, if everyone has the same amount of money, Gini is zero. And if only one person has all the money, Gini is one. It turns out that people seem to be happiest when Gini is about 0.27, so about a quarter of the way up. We like to compete a little, but we don't want things to be unjust. And so I think when we have these new technologies coming in, then all of a sudden uh, there will be there'll be companies like Amazon did this when they bought uh, Whole Foods. You know, they, 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 they work really hard to make everybody get the same amount of money and for us all to be exchangeable. And I think that's what we have to fight against. We, 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 want, we, want, we want equality, we want equity, but we also want to be special and we want to be valued for what we've brought to the plate. And so I think, I think that's, uh, that's part of what we need to think about when we're really thinking broadly about inclusion is thinking about how people can specialize and, and how they can be rewarded for the, what they bring to society. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. So I think we are all special in our specialized ways. Uh, and also, I think uh, I was watching this Netflix show called Superstore. And uh, there, there was this episode where uh, the, su the supermarket hires a robot to do the cleaning. And uh, then the staff, which is the floor staff says, oh, our hours are being cut and they take the robot and throw it down the roof, thinking that it is destroyed. And then the robot goes up again and starts working. Uh, so, so there is a lot of, as you mentioned, uh, this sense about people not being valued. I think at the core of it, policies need to also be humane and they need to value how people feel and not just talk about uh, the, the hard numbers, which definitely inform the discussion, as you mentioned about the Gini coefficient being 0 0.27. And I would invite you to put the paper in the chat uh, for anyone who may be interested to read. So we have about five minutes left, and then the IGF secretariat is sending me a lot of messages to uh, wrap up. Uh, I will close with one minute each to all our panelists uh, with what is it that you think should come out of this session, uh, this conversation that we are having today? What, what is your takeaway and what would you like, where would you like us to go? It will be just one minute and then I'm also prompted that we should take a group photo. Uh, so I, I, I will start with perhaps on stage. Eleanor, if we can, if we can hear from you. Yeah. Hello, Pratik. Yes, please go ahead. Right. So um, I would say that if we are having discussion about AI and um, you know the multi-stakeholder process, we need to make sure that we are looking around the room to see whether the people who are going to be impacted or or who benefit from um, the use of AI are represented and whether we are hearing their inputs and their, uh, their concerns and whether that's been captured and whether they have a chance to be able to help in iterations or uh, be able to give their feedback or be able to monitor uh, the impact that this has on their lives. If that's not happening, then we need to really rethink it because we can't just have um, data scientists and technologists uh, deciding how things should be. We should be able to include uh, people from the uh, public sector, especially governments who have to take care of uh, the legislations that govern the public good, and then also look at uh, civil society groups who tend to be in academia, uh, who are um, more, uh, you know, who have a say on what the public's, uh, and are looking at the public interest as well. So this is very, very critical, making sure we look around the room who is this going to impact? And is that person or are those people there to be able to give input into how things are designed and how the impact happens? 
Thank, thank you, Eleanor. That's a very tweetable quote, uh, and we are going to take that up. Uh, so we look around the room, how people are impacted, and involve them in the discussion and in the process, and then have a metric to actually measure it. We, we have very little time, uh, so I'd request all of you to keep your remarks short. Next, we go to Esther. Thank you very much. I think I'll add to what Eleanor was saying and then say that um, in addition to the people that it benefits, also people it's going to be. Um, that's also people that need to be in the room so that they can understand or even be discussed and put out how they're actually going to be to be um, affected. So I think I'll put it, uh, I'll put it that way and just adding to what Eleanor was saying. Thank you. Thank you, Eleanor. Uh, over to you, Jibu. Uh, yes, Pradeek. So I, I think uh, this should be the beginning of the whole process. I mean, this this discourse regarding uh, AI and its effect and uh, you know everything regarding safety and all these things. It's it's not a thing which is open and shut, right? It's a it's a continuous conversation. It, it needs further uh, discourse and deliberation. And I personally feel there should be an enforceable uh, framework uh, to hold. The, hold the uh, whether it's private sector or public sector hold them accountable uh, when it comes to uh, you know uh, moving away from whatever ethical or moral uh, principles so th that's uh, my two cents here so accountability is key in this process uh, joanna okay I, i'm going to say very quickly two things one in response to what eleanor said which is really important but i still want to say science doesn't decide things maybe scientists sometimes but basically science is about uh, making predictions and providing understanding. It is absolutely the role of governments and governance to make the decisions, to make the normative calls. So that, that is just so important. But what I would say in summary is actually, since I accidentally pasted the wrong paper anyway, but coming back to what we were saying before, it's, it's actually a kind of exclusion that we don't acknowledge just how much great stuff is already being done by parts of the world that are not always identified with AI. And so that paper I accidentally pasted into the chat was, about, was examining the narrative that was only coming from, the, from China and the US and not from the EU. But it turns out that if you exclude all three of those three great powers, that the, other, the rest of the world combined is actually doing more than China and the EU combined. So it's, it's important to, to recognize, and it is actually, uh, I think it's a form of disempowerment when people try to, to um, marginalize the amount of impacts that we're already making from countries all over the world. Thank you so much, Joanna. I think that's super important. The other, uh, I, I hate to, I have to close, but I just want to add one more thing. The other day, I was part of a panel where people were talking about development and democracy, and people were saying uh, as if democracy is Western. And uh, I, I thought that is super disempowering for people who are working for democracy and human rights around the world. I'm like, this is unacceptable. But over to you, Hillary. Thanks, Pratik. And I, I agree with everyone, especially what Eleanor has said. Representation matters because not only that we could identify gaps and how are we complementing each other's you know, strengths to fill in this gap through multi-stakeholder uh, approaches, but also because through representation, we can actually safeguard this process, right? And make sure human rights is at the center of this whole policymaking processes. So that's my takeaway. And then I guess to close it, I hope uh, the biggest takeaway is that I hope our conversation doesn't end here and hopefully it will translate to a more stronger and more concrete collaboration. Uh, and I really look forward to engaging uh, with everyone here as well as the audience uh, right after this session. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you all. Rest assured, we will get back to you and we would love to co-create something and work with you. Uh, thanks to everyone who joined. If those who are here, if you would like to turn on your uh, camera for a second, uh, our colleagues want to take a screenshot for the news item uh, that they would like to produce. So as many faces we have, it's better. Uh, so we wait for a second. Uh, well, very well. We see so many people. Lovely to see you all. Uh, so, Steve, we, we are all here for you. Okay, thank you, Lau. I'll just count to three. Three, two, one, smile. Okay, we are good to go. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you so much, everyone. Was it was lovely talking to you. Take care. Bye-bye.